Thank you very much. We are here to bring you the story behind the music you love and to introduce you to the men who make that music at Orchestra Hall. You'll also get to hear an informal and easy-to-understand discussion of music and its interesting personalities. And what's more, you, listening right now, have an opportunity to win two main floor tickets for a concert by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. And today, let's turn to the pages of your symphony scrapbook devoted to that much maligned instrument, the viola. And we have as our guest performer, Mr. Milton Fries, first violist of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Mr. Fries, I think this uh, occasion is one to be uh, noted, because if my memory serves me right at our the first um, recording or broadcast of your symphony scrapbook, which occurred in early February 19... 19- Fifty, uh, you were the guest then, weren't you? Yes, that's right, Mr. Kuiper. I sort of remember that occasion because uh, I had to get off a rehearsal, if you remember, to come here and make the recording. And uh, Fritz Bush was conducting at the time, and it took us quite a while to make the first recording. I think we were all rather nervous. You're quite poised now, I It was see. a big event. <laughs> and uh, I got back about five minutes before the rehearsal ended, and Dr. Bush, with his gruff sense of humor, took a deep bow, stopping the orchestra, of course, and said, how nice of you to come back. Well, it's good to have you back here, and uh, I was wondering if uh, you would identify for our listeners the selection you played at the beginning of uh, this broadcast, and uh, perhaps um, play a little more from that composition. Yes, Mr. Carper, that was the theme of the theme and variations by Alan Shulman. Well, wait a minute. Wasn't, uh, didn't Mr. Schumann, uh, recently dedicate a, uh, one of his new compositions to you? Oh, yes, I'm very proud of that. Uh, he's just written a suite for, uh, unaccompanied solo viola. And I have the honor and pleasure to have the dedication. Now, could we hear a little more of the, uh, of the Schumann? Perhaps the theme and some variation? All right, perhaps play just the theme and the first part of each variation. Good. second half of the theme, of course. Now, the first variation is very simple and related to the theme. Now, the second variation is a rather rhythmical one. third variation is a duet between the viola and the bassoon in the orchestration. Fourth variation is a Siciliano, and it's muted. The fifth variation is a very technical one called Vivace. It starts very soft and builds up to quite a climax at the end with the orchestra just sweeping down the whole works. The sixth variation is titled Andante Comodo. is called Allegro Ritmico, quite a technical thing, and a little later, the xylophone player has quite a part, as our xylophone player can testify. 
And the finale is a chorale, a cadenza, and a postlude. Works up the quiet cadenza and ends in this quiet mood. Well, now, uh, Mr. Shulman is not the only uh, composer who has dedicated uh, a composition to you. Uh, one of the... Uh, Outstanding ones, I recall, is Mr. Block. Yes. Uh, as a result of the Block Festival that was given in Chicago in 1950, in appreciation, he wrote a suite of viola pieces, five Jewish, Jewish pieces. And I have the pleasure and honor to have two of these pieces dedicated to me. I wonder if you could uh, play something from uh, one of those. Yes. I'll play part of the meditation first. It opens with a viola all alone, unaccompanied. Part of the affirmation? Yes. Do we have a short selection from that? ask a, a question about the uh, instrument you're playing, but uh, I will have to ask uh, a question about the two instruments you have uh, with you. Well, and uh, why bring uh, two violas to the studio? Well, there's always a chance the string might break at the wrong moment. But uh, actually, it's very interesting. I think I happen to be playing a very beautiful Montagnana viola. It was made in 19, uh, 1723. This viola belongs to the collection of Mr. Ralph Norton, one of our trustees. And recently, a copy of this instrument was made in Chicago at the Kagan Violin Shop. The maker of the craftsman was Franz Kimberg. I thought it might be interesting for the audience to hear a new instrument and an old. Well, I think it'd be particularly interesting uh, to any viola players who um, happen to be uh, listening in. So I think uh, let's uh, uh, keep it a secret, um, which is uh, which. If you could play the uh, same selection on the uh, first one instrument and then the other without announcing which one. Uh, see if your friends among the viola players can tell the difference. I'm sure you can tell the difference. Well, under the fingers and under the ear, it's, rather, it's easy to tell the difference. There's a certain feeling that you can't get away from with an old instrument, but I think it's remarkable. Well, I'll let you judge, too. Now, this is an interesting uh, uh, comparison or uh, contrast, especially in view of the many discussions we've had with string players on the symphony scrapbook about whether they prefer an old instrument or a new one. Now, let's try the, the second one.
right. Well, that's an interesting uh, test for our listeners. Now, the um, instruments certainly uh, look alike. Does that mean that uh, when you say a copy, they use the same type of wood? Well, no. Wood, I don't think you can duplicate, although the new instrument was made with a very old European wood. The copy is as is mostly the measurements are exactly alike and the appearance very mm -hmm. much alike. Now, you I said you, you could tell the difference. In other words, if you were handed uh, one of these instruments in the uh, dark and played it, you could tell at once which was the old instrument, which was the new. Yes. Uh, how could you tell? Well, there's a feeling of an old instrument under the fingers and response that a new instrument doesn't quite have, although many of the musicians think a new instrument is far superior to some of our old instruments. Yes, I know we've had uh, several string players on this uh, this program who uh, really seem to prefer the uh, the new uh, instrument, but... Um, I suppose that'll be a battle that goes on for all time. <laughs> oh, I, uh, I imagine so. Um, it, it, it may be that... Um, uh, or could it be? Let me put it in the form of a question, because you're you're the expert. That a uh, player gets used to a certain instrument, to the to the sound, to the uh, uh, feel of it. Well, not too much, I don't think. But um, it, it is rather interesting with all our science and uh, our accurate uh, measurements, all our uh, technical skill. We're still unable to uh, to duplicate uh, the old. Well, we'll see what our listeners think about this. And thanks ever so much, Mr. Priest, for this interesting demonstration. Now we'd like to send a pair of tickets for a concert by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra to Mr. Norman uh, Dearborn of Dubu uh, Dubuque, Iowa, uh, for his interesting letter, which I'd uh, like to read with some pride. He said, I enjoy the symphony scrapbook very much and make every effort to hear each presentation of it. That was a fine demonstration of the oboe yesterday. This letter was written some time ago. And I was interested in the talk given by the second violist who pointed out the difficulty of the second parts while the first had the melody. I am an orchestra teacher in the public schools here in Dubuque, and that point is often hard to put over to those who must play second violins in my orchestras. To show you that you have an audience here in the city, I asked all my string players in the junior high school orchestra to write down what they heard on the viola broadcast. These pupils are in the 7th, 8th, and ninth grades, and I thought you might be interested in what some of them wrote. Your Dubuque audience is perhaps not so large every time, but I always encourage my people to listen whenever they can. And thanks ever so much to Mr. Dearborn for writing me that interesting letter. <laughs> 